stand for today. You there? All right. By the way, while you're all standing, you, you know that uh, last week was uh, a precious and precious, precious, gorgeous lady that I love so much. It was her birthday, Mother Worsham, it was her birthday. And <laughs> and I just want to say happy birthday, beautiful, I love you. <laughs> She is precious to my heart. You have your, your programs. So read it responsively, okay? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Wow. I, I am great. Uh, excuse me. I am severely afflicted. Give me life according. Oh, help me, Lord. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O oh Lord, according to your word. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. Your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. Together, I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. This guy's serious, isn't he? Oh, Father, you, your word is already challenging our hearts in the very reading of it. So we, we run, we make haste right now to your throne of grace, seeking the grace of illumination in this time of need. We need to understand what you're teaching us today. So teach us, dear God. Teach us through your servant. Teach your people. Illumine our minds. Open our hearts to not only understand, but to receive your word sharply and graciously and willingly, Father, so that obedience to you flows from a heart of joy and love over you and your word. Oh, Holy Spirit, work as we saw on last week, you, you are the only one that has access to the heart. You are the teacher. Preach today, teach today through your servant. Give me grace to say what you intended to say. So what your people hear is not the word of a man, but it, the truth, your word, the word of the living God. I pray and I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before beginning, I want to read to you a Calvin's prayer for illumination before the sermon that he would preach. Here's how Calvin would praise. Let us call upon our good God and Father, since all fullness of wisdom and light is found in him, mercifully to enlighten us by the Holy Spirit in the true understanding of his word and to give us grace to receive it in true fear and humility. May we be taught by his word to place our trust only in him and to serve and honor him as we ought, so that we may glorify his holy name in all of our living and edify our neighbor by our good example, 
rendering to God the love and obedience which faithful servants owe their masters and children their parents, since it has pleased him graciously to receive us among the number of his servants and children. It's a great prayer for illumination. How Calvin would pray before the sermon. May God grant us that, that grace. Today I want to uh, pr preach the Lord wills uh, verses 105 and 106 as we try to set this stanza up for the rest of our time preaching on next Sunday and hmm, maybe the next. I want to I want us to look at this theme together, godly determination. Godly determination. What kind of determination? Godly determination. Remember, each stanza begins with the letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Remember that? This is the nun, okay, in the Hebrew. And it actually pictures the improbable. It pictures a fish standing on its tail. This alphabet represents total concentration. The plan of God which calls for believers to reflect the glory and exhibit the power of God requires absolute concentration from the people of God on the word of God. We are exhorted to bear down with our, with our minds on Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, and to reflect on Jesus so that we may not grow weary and lose heart. That's the Hebrew alphabet that actually begins this stanza. That's the picture. That's the idea. That's what it communicates. Now, this stanza follows naturally from the last as well as the one before that, okay? Remember, we talked before the last stanza, we talked about, beginning in verse 89, secure in the sure word of God. So, uh, we move now from stability, and then the last stanza was on wisdom, we move from stability to wisdom to godly determination. In the last stanza, remember, he rejoiced in the greater wisdom of the Word of God, a wisdom that we saw clearly leads to a changed life. Now he affirms forcefully his godly determination to walk in the way of the Lord or in the way of the word. I want you to hear that, that, that this is indeed his tone in this stanza. I want you to hear that. We, we hear the tone, I'm saying, of godly determination in this stanza. Notice the tone we hear. We hear it in verse 105. We hear to walk by the light of the word. A determination, right? In verse 106, we see an oath sworn and confirmed to keep the word. In verse 109, we hear him saying, I do not forget your word. In verse 110, we hear him saying, I do not stray from the word. And above all, and climactically, in verse 112, he says, I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. This is a language of godly decision, godly determination. Do you hear that? Your tone is all over this stanza. Godly determination. Let's look at what this means. Only looking today again at verses 105 and 106. First, first of all, I want you to see the, 
the Christians, the Christian's testimony concerning the illuminating word of God. The Christian's testimony concerning the illuminating word of God. The Christian's testimony. You know, when we talk about illuminating, we're, 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 ta we're, we're talking about God's word being a light to our path, a lamp to our feet. What does, what does that mean? And, and, and also, I want to add, I said the Christian's testimony because I'm arguing from this, these verses that that should be the testimony of every blood-bought, born-again believer in Christ. This verse 105 should be the testimony of every born-again Christian. The, the Christian's testimony concerning the illuminating word of God. This should be all of our testimony. Your word is a lamp to my feet. He declares, and a light to my path. I want you to notice three things here, three, three truths about this testimony, three truths about light that we see uh, uh, in, in, in this verse. I want you to see, first of all, that light carries us through darkness. Now, he has two familiar biblical images that are combined in this verse. Life is a path. And God's word is a light that helps us follow the right path, right? So light for the path is simple, but a lamp for the feet is more specific. Are you with me? A light, a, a light beloved, uh, on the path shows us the direction in which we are heading, but a lamp shows us the next step we need to take. Right? A light, no matter how bright, will, will not show us all the twists and turns uh, ahead on the road, but the, but the lamp will show us the next step to take. Now, the ancient world did not have light such as we have today, okay? They did not have lights like we have today. The people carried little clay dishes cont containing oil and and the, 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 the light illuminated the path only one step ahead. We do not see the whole route at one time. The Christian life, we walk by faith, right? And we walk by faith when we follow the word of God. Each act of obedience shows us the next step until we eventually and finally arrive at our final destination, which is heaven. Now, I know we're told that this is an enlightened age, <laughs> but actually we do live in a dark world. We live in a dark world. And only God's light can guide us righteously through the world. See, obedience to the word of God keeps us walking in the light. I want you to see this. Turn quickly to 1 John. 1 John. Chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. All I want you to see there is this. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ keeps on cleansing us from all sin. See, beloved, obedience to the word of God is walking in the light. 
If you're taking steps in the dark, you can't see, you can't see what's in front of you. And you become unsure of the next step, don't you? The light of God's word carries us one step at a time. The light of God's word will, will, will help us see our next step, make the next decision, make the right decision as it carries us through the darkness. So we know the Bible does not unroll the whole map of life before us at one time. Now, beloved, if God did that, we'd be too terrified to get up the next day. Have I got any warriors here? I mean, God, God didn't begin with Abraham by saying, Abraham, give up your son. If God had told him, now, okay, I'm calling you out of the earth of the Chaldeans to a place that I'll show you. And uh, sooner or later, you're going to have a son, a uh, son of promise, uh, Isaac, but you're going to have to give him up. That would have terrified Abraham. No, God took him one step at a time. The word of God is a lamp to our feet because there are times when we need something more specific than a general principle. We need to know exactly what the next step should be. You know what happens if you're a student of the word, especially what happens the Holy Spirit suddenly and illumines a specific text or passage of Scripture to your mind and makes it clear to you in the need of the moment. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It was George Mueller that, said, that used to say that often the stops as well as the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. <laughs> Not just the steps, but often the stops, as well as the steps, are ordered by the Lord. So it, it is a matter of vital importance that once God has indicated the way we are to take, we obey his leading. I also, I also want you to note here, if we think about the light carrying us now, David here, or the psalmist, if you don't believe it's David, the psalmist could not have been guided by God's word unless he first renounced the wisdom of the world and of the flesh. See, it's only when you renounce the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of the flesh, it's only when you renounce that that you're brought to this. The, 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 the word of God, the word of God is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. But there has to be a renouncing before that takes place. So you're not teachable if you're not renouncing the wisdom of the world. You're not teachable. You're only teachable when you're brought to the point to renounce all of the wisdom and come up under in submissiveness to the authority of the word of God the Lordship of Christ. It carries us. Light carries us, doesn't it? The light of the word carries us one step at a time. But I, I, I want you to see that follows logically from this point. Light also clarifies our way. The Hebrew word actually means a lamp. Uh, 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 as we see here, uh, a lamp or a candle. And, and the idea is that the word of God is like a torch or a lamp to man in a dark night. It shows him the way. It prevents him from stumbling over obstacles or falling down cliffs or wandering off into other paths that leads to danger. It's a light which shines on the road that a man treads so that he can see the path and he can see any danger that may be in the path. I'd hate to be walking a path without light in the dark and there's a snake in the path. Have I got any warriors here? This expression is really beautiful because if you, if you make the word of God your guide, you obey its teaching, you're in the right way, correct? So if you're in the right way, obeying the word of God, then, then you can clearly see the path, right? 
So, so, so you'll be able to mark the road that you ought to take, that the way you ought to go, but also you'll be able to avoid paths that you shouldn't be on. I want to know the right way to go, but I also want to, want to avoid the wrong way. So I need the clarity of God's word. Now I wear glasses, but, you know, when I'm trying to read the small print on the back of a bottle, you know what I do? I hold it under the light so I can see it better. Saying sometimes we want to see things clear. We, you know where you need to hold it? If you want to see it clear, you need to hold it under the light. <laughs> I don't have clarity regarding this moral decision or regarding what I should do. You need to hold it under the, under the light. I found out a long time ago that what the world judges right is perverse and crooked. The manner of living they approve of is perverse and crooked. We need that which is framed according to the law of God, the word of God. Do you know what else I see by way of application that this verse teaches? This verse teaches the clarity of scripture or what the reformers would call the perspicuity uh, of, of holy scripture. Uh, it, it actually teaches that. And what they, and what they mean by clarity or perspicuity is that the Bible is basically comprehensible to any open-minded person who actually reads it. Y'all don't hear me preaching, do you? They, were, they, they also argued that not, not all parts are equally clear and easy to understand, but, but, it, but it, and, and it is helpful to have wisdom from others and, and what they have seen in the Holy Scripture to be taught by others. But what they are arguing is, at, at, at the core, the Bible can be understood, and Christians do understand it. Right? Am I talking to anybody in here? It's clear. Let me highlight that point a little bit more as the Spirit doing, doing it right now just brought to my mind. He just brought to my mind, the Spirit did it, uh, uh, Psalm 19. Go to Psalm 19. I think it's verse 9. Psalm 19. Just to highlight this point a little bit more. You have Psalm 19? You there? I started verse seven, okay? I think it's verse seven that I actually want anyway. The law of the Lord is perfect. That's the word of God. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul, doesn't it? Watch this. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise who? That's the perspicuity of Scripture right there. The clarity of the Word of God. It does not matter who you are. If you are a blood-bought Christian and you've been born again, God is saying right now to you that your, His Word is understandable. So make sure you, you don't leave this verse with this. Well, if I had the clarity that Pastor Jacks had. If I could see like Pastor Jacks could see, well, you can. The Spirit makes it clear to me, but I'm not some super Christian. He makes it clear to all believers. In fact, the Spirit is saying to you this morning, the word is clear. It's clear. Listen, beloved. This, this, this will hurt a little bit. I mean no harm. But if you tell me you have no appetite for Scripture, and if you tell me you can't understand anything you read in Scripture, you're saying more, more to me than you realize. All right? 
Better check it. Newborn babes do des desire the sincere makeup of the word, right? Have I got some warriors here? Psalm 119 is so important to us, you know what? <laughs> It's clear, it's sufficient, it's because it's God's word. God makes wise the simple. So light, light clarifies the way, doesn't it? <laughs> no Christian can have the excuse that, 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 that the reason I don't walk in the path because I don't have clarity. Don't you have a lamp? Right? These lamps are easy to come in contact with. They're all in the bookstores. They're, they're, all, they're, they're, they're on your phone. They're, <laughs> they're on your computers. Right? I, I've got about 15 of them in my office. Light clarifies the way. But I want you to see a third thing about light. Light is crucial. It's crucial. This verse is arguing that light is crucial. Now, now, now understand, really verse 105 is more about godliness than it is about guidance. In fact, in fact, the words lamp and light are associated not really with God, guidance as a topic, but rather with covenant safety in the context of danger. That is, the lamp and the light are needed to keep the believer from straying off the path and into danger. Let me give you, some, give you a couple of examples. For example, Psalm 132, verse 17, God promises a lamp for my anointed. This means that his anointed king, Jesus Christ, will grow in strength over his enemies. He'll be kept safe. Covenant safety. In Psalm 18, 28, we read, it is you who light my lamp. And, 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 and that is written in the context of salvation, victory, and refuge. In Proverbs 6, 23, for the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light and the reproof of disciplines are the way of life. So I, 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 I need a lamp as a Christian. Not, first of all, to choose whether to go right or left, but, but, but I need a lamp so that I don't stumble while I'm going right. Y'all don't hear me preaching. I need a lamp for covenant safety. Right? So he's not talking about career guidance here, Okay. But he's talking about a lamp to keep me walking in the right way, to protect me from the traps of darkness. Right? To keep me from falling into sin. Right? You know, when the devil tempted Jesus the Lord, guess what was a lamp to his feet and a light to his path? The Word of God. <laughs> right? Jesus kept saying, it is written. Turn these stones into bread. What's the next step, Jesus? Well, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of, of God. He used the word of God. Beloved, unless the word of God enlightens your path, the implication from this verse is your whole life is enshrined in darkness, obscurity. All you can do is just miserably wander through the world. But when the word of God is your lamp, you're not in danger of going astray. I didn't say you wouldn't have difficulty. I didn't say you wouldn't have opposition. I said when the word of God is your lamp, you're not in danger of going astray. Right? I didn't say you wouldn't have difficulty. I didn't say you wouldn't have opposition. I didn't say there wouldn't be persecution. I didn't say there wouldn't be problems. I didn't say there wouldn't be trials. Here's what I'm saying. When the word of God is your lamp, you're not in danger of going astray. Listen, to follow the light of the word 
is to follow Christ. Isn't it? Then Jesus says, I am the, I, I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. If you follow me, you will not walk in darkness. And, and listen, listen to what John said about Jesus in, 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 in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 9. He called Jesus the true light, which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. That word true means genuine and real. Now watch this. There are other lights. There are other ideas. There are other products. There are other activities. But there's only one true light. Everything else that the world brings across will lead you farther and farther into darkness. Only one true light. Right? Jesus, and that's Jesus, right? No other light can show you the truth about God. No other light can show you the truth about yourself. No, no other light can show you the truth about life. No other light can show you the truth about death. No other light can show you the truth about e eternity. No other light can inspire us to become truly what God intended us to be except Christ himself. So to follow the lamp of the word is to follow Christ. Some. Psalmist David said in Psalm 23, verse 3, he, he, leads, he leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. If you're not following Christ, your soul will not arrive safely in heaven. All right? Well, light carries us, doesn't it? The light of the word, it clarifies our way. It is crucial because without it, we're in darkness. Is that your testimony then? I'm just asking. <laughs> My point is, the Christian's testimony concerning the illuminating word of God, uh, will you at least agree with me that that must be truthfully every Christian's testimony? Because I, I have no way, I don't know the next step. I'm not clear. And I'm in darkness. That's how crucial it is. Without the lamp of God's word. I want you to see a second thing here in verse 106. I want you to see the Christian's resolution. The Christian's resolution in view of the illuminating word of God. You can't have a testimony without a resolution that follows. Right? Oh, you're quiet now. Just hear it then, just hear it. Verse 106. I'll do a little exposition here and I'm done. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. Now verse 106, watch this, this is sound theology. Deep too. It comes after verse 105. Right? It, verse 105 is probably among at least one of the most popular verses in Holy Scripture. Right? But sometimes when we will highlight a verse that's so popular, sometimes we'll grab it out of its context. Remember, yes, the Word of God is a, a, a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. But the psalmist went on to say, in view of that, I make a resolution, right? Sounds like some commitment, doesn't it? Okay, I'll, need, I'll show you two things about this commitment. Number one, number one, number one, I want you to see the intensity of Christian commitment. The intensity of Christian commitment. How intense is this commitment? I have sworn an oath and confirmed it. Now I hear you. Pastor, this Old Testament. <laughs> I'm coming. I, 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 I want you to hear what he's announcing. He's announcing his deliberate purpose to conform his life to God's word. Right? This is his conformity of life to God's word. 
Now, you, you've already heard the aspiration of, uh, of that really in, 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 the, uh, in the first part of this stanza in, in, in verse 105. You heard his aspiration. The word of God is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, right? I, I want your word to, to guide me on the way. I want godliness. I want your word to show me the way through this dark world. But now, notice he deliberately purposes to conform his life to God's word. This is important. I've sworn an oath. That's actually one word in the Hebrew. It's one word. It does mean to swear, to bind oneself by an oath. The sense of the word is to promise solemnly, usually invoking the divine witness, God himself, regarding your future acts of behavior. Right? He's saying, I have solemnly purposed. I have given, I have given to this purpose the solemnity and sanction of an oath. Which means I have called God to witness. I, I, I have formed the purpose in my heart, I have formed it in his presence. And I am conscious that as I speak this, his eye is on me. <laughs> now listen, because of the way some Christians have misunderstood what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, some Christians are afraid of vows and oaths. Yeah, you remember Jesus said, I, I, I'll go there for you, okay? I'll go there for you. You remember Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be, be known. Anything beyond that is from the evil one. That's what he said, right? And many well-meaning, well Bible-believing Christians have thought, oh, Jesus is teaching that we should not take vows anymore. Well, if that's the case, what do you do with Luke 22, verses 14 through 19, where Jesus takes a vow twice? Right? Right? <laughs> well, what do you do with the passages in the book of Acts where Paul takes vows? What do you do in the book of Hebrews when God himself swore by himself regarding the covenant of grace? He swore by himself because he could swear by no one greater. Right? What do you do with that, right? So, in the Sermon on the Mount, it's clear to me because the Bible cannot contradict itself. You know why? Because it's the Word of God. The Bible cannot contradict itself because it is the Word of God. So, it's a misunderstanding of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount to say that Jesus is saying that vows are wrong and Christians shouldn't use them anymore. This might hurt a little bit. Sometimes we have to stay away from vows because we stay, like to stay away from commitment. <laughs> Here we have in the text the psalmist's tenacious, resolute vow that he will stay loyal to the word of God because it is his only light. Oh, how we need to make such commitments today, Christians. So often we are, we are loyal to our changing feelings, to our childish thoughts, to our humanistic ideas, and even to our church traditions. We need to make a commitment to keep the word. We have never needed a resolve like this more than more since the days of the Protestant Reformation. Saints, we compromise truth, we capitulate error, we contradict God's very words. There needs to be some intensity in our commitment to follow Christ. Right? It needs to be an intensity so real and so genuine until we are willing to make commitments to the Lord, calling on God himself as our witness. Right? 
Come on, this is passion right here, isn't it? This is passion for the Lord. This is passion for his word. And, and passion is a strong emotion that rises up from, from somebody's heart because they have such an enthusiasm and a love in their heart for the glory of God, the supremacy of Christ. This is intense enthusiasm for the truth. This is a passion for the truth that, that comes out of deep convictions about God, about Christ, about the gospel, right? This is an intense commitment. Would you agree with that? But would you agree that God is calling you to the same intense commitment? How do I know that? What well, just turn in, the, in your minds to what you know in the New Testament. Of any man will be my disciple. Let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Is that intense? It's pretty intense, isn't it? If your right eye offends you, pluck it out. Is that intense? If you don't hate mother, father, sister, or brother, and even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. Is that intense? Note the words cannot. You better think about this and the intensity of this vow in light of the teachings of our Lord here as well as in the New Testament. We need to be, have an intense commitment to follow Christ, a deep passion to follow Christ, to be committed to the word of God. But I want you to notice not only the intensity, I want you to notice another I. Notice the intent of Christian commitment. What's your intent? We see your intensity. He takes an oath in the very presence of God, calling God as a witness with God's eye on him. What is your intent? He said, let me just read it. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. Wow. The word confirm means to arise, to stand up. And in the literal sense, it speaks of, in the literal sense, it speaks of physical action arising up or standing. But there's a figurative sense to the word as well that we actually see here that I, I can illustrate. You remember when Balaam tells Balak in Numbers 23, 18, to rise up to receive God's oracle. Well, Balaam was not telling Balak to, to rise from his seat because he was already standing by, uh, by his burnt offering. But, but the sense is that he will raise his attention, stir up himself with all diligence to hear what he was about to say. And I'm saying to you, he's saying, I'm stirred up in my diligence. I'm stirred up in my passion. I'm stirred up in my loyalty for the Lord to keep his righteous rules. Y'all not praying with me. Listen, here's what he's saying. This is not a mere purpose in my heart. I'm going to do this. Ooh, come here to me. Th this is not a mere purpose in my heart. He's saying, I am going to do this. Right? Now, this might hurt a little bit, but I'm going to say it. This is also the resolution of all who make a true profession of faith in Christ. Listen, you've been saved. It's your intention, right? It's your intention. It's your solemn determination to carry out your commitment to its full accomplishment, right? And you want to carry that out always, right? Every place, right? While life lasts, right? Forever, right? Come on, I'm not talking to churchgoers here. I'm talking to Christians, right? Listen, any man, any woman 
who makes a profession of faith intending not to carry it out. It is clearly implied in this text. It is clearly implied. If you make a profession of faith with no intention to carry it out, you are a hypocrite. You know what a hypocrite is? A play actor with a mask on. You know why they have the mask on? Because they're pretending to be something that they really are not. Have I got any warriors here? See, unless there's a solemn purpose to, to keep the law of God and to always keep it, to defend the truth of the word of God to the best of your knowing and always defend it, you cannot possibly be a friend of God. One writer put it like this, that he's saying this. I am bound and determined to keep your righteous judgments. <laughs> right? He took an oath to live according to the word of God. That's foundational. To make this type of binding commitment to obey God. Rules here is just another word for the laws of God. These were rulings that would guide him in right choices. Now I ask, I raise this question myself. Perhaps you're raising it in your own heart. This guy's arrogant. Is he arrogant? Oh, okay. He's in the Bible. Let's get a guy that's not in the Bible. Am I arrogant? If I say, I will promise to keep your righteous rules Lord, I'm talking to the Lord to the end is that arrogance what's wrong with this guy come on somebody would say well he thinks more highly of himself than he ought No, he's not arrogant. Watch this. Because when God saved him, he put that intent in his heart. Y'all don't, y'all not praying with me. Oh, go, go on home. You ain't praying with me. Right? See, it's not arrogant, especially if it's done by a believer in the spirit of faith. And you're praying 2 Thessalonians 1, 11. Remember, uh, you want God to fulfill the vow you take. Now here's what I'm saying. Make the commitment and pray for grace to keep it. Right? This is God-given, grace-enabled purpose of mine that, that, that he will turn to the word of God as his lamp. Are you with me? I had the wonderful privilege of uh, obtaining uh, an older guy, Charles Bridges, his, his commentary. I had the wonderful privilege of obtaining that uh, big hardback book on, on uh, the Psalms several years ago. Actually, when I was uh, preaching for Brother Charles Fitchpatrick, Sister Christiana's father, I was preaching for him, and we, uh, we left. He used to bring me to the airport that Monday, and uh, by my request, I wanted to stop by uh, the Banner of Truth bookstore. <laughs> I wanted to stop by the Banner of Truth, and um, the, the manager there uh, told me to spent up to like 300 bucks just picking out anything I want and it would be the pastor's discount. I mean, it would, it would be the pastor's, uh, coming to the pastor's and giving so I wouldn't have to pay anything. I'm thinking of my man, you got the wrong one. <laughs> Which made me love Brother Fitzpatrick even more. Because of course he, he knew him and you know, my, I think it was my association with him. This actually has nothing to do with the text, okay? But, but I was able to obtain that book, okay? 
I, I had been wanting Charles Bridges' uh, book on, 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 on Psalms, but you know, it, it is a little bit pricey because it, uh, at the time it only came in hardback. But, but Charles Bridges has in, in his book a little story that he tells uh, about a man named Pierce who, who read this book uh, in that was titled Rise and Progress of Religion and from it, he, de he decided to uh, live a more dedicated and obedient life. He wrote out a covenant with God, and in a very serious and solemn way, he signed it with his own blood. It wasn't long until he started failing in his commitment to the covenant, first in small ways, and then more and more. And that plunged him into deep distress, almost to total despair. Then he considered that the arrangement he had made with God was actually legalistic and pharisaical, especially in the way that he relied on the power of his own vows and resolution. So he took the covenant to the top of his house, tore it into small pieces, and threw it to the wind. But, but yet, he, he, yet, when he threw it to the wind, he, didn't, he, didn't, he did not feel himself free from the promises that he had made. Only now he was of the mind to rely, to, to rely not on himself, to keep his promise but on the blood of Jesus and on the indwelling Holy Spirit and he found out that he experienced a lot better results and had a lot more comfort and a lot more restoration even when he failed here's all I'm saying here's all that Bridges is saying by telling that story make the vow, make the commitment but rely on the Spirit And here's what the psalmist is saying, though. The intent ought to be in your heart. You saved. You redeemed. You blood bought. You washed in this blood of the Lamb. You experienced amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Save a wretch like you. Once was lost, now found. Blind, but now I see. And you're going to tell me that you don't have a real intent to obey God? Oh, oh come on. Everybody got any warriors here. Right? See, I'm saying that because I don't want you to be blown away by what you see here in verse 6. This is just biblical Christianity. Christians are supposed to be committed to the word of God. Right? I'll close with this. You know, uh, so Pastor, you give me a little more motivation. Well, I give you enough, I think, but you have the indwelling Holy Spirit, right? Okay, I'm going to give you a little more motivation, and I'm going to the seat. All right? You want to get motivated on this? Even more. Okay? You already see you have all the strength you need, right? Right? In Christ, you have all the strength you need. Now, if you don't have Christ, you need to, you need to come running, not to me, but you need to come running in faith in your heart right now. Say, Lord, I'm lost. I want to be found. Lord, I want to put all of my trust, total reliance, total trust in you right now. I believe that you died. I believe that you rose again. I believe you, that you are who you say you are, fully God, fully man. I believe that you died and paid the penalty for all of my sins. I believe that you rose again the third day. I repent of my whole life because it's been wrong, and I trust, I rely totally on Christ. Let me give you some more motivation. My argument in giving this motivation in closing is this. The motivation for making a commitment to Christ should and ought to flow out of the commitment he's already made to you. You know, Christ is an I will type of guy. <laughs> Y'all don't hear me, do you? <laughs> You, you know, Christ is all about commitment. You know that? If, if he wasn't, he would have never made it to Calvary, right? But, but Christ is all about commitment no matter what the cost. So 
You're thinking about godly determination. You're thinking about the lamp and the light of the word. You're thinking about the commitment that you make. Well, let me motivate you by listening to the commitment that he makes. There's the I wills of Christ. I can't give you all of them, but I'll just give you a few of them. For example, in John 6, 37, listen to our Lord. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. That's a commitment that if you come, I will never cast out, right? So the person that I just spoke to a moment ago, if you're lost, listen to him, the commitment that he makes. He says, if you come, I will never cast out. Then there's the I will of his cleansing. Listen, listen to Luke 5, 13, and, and Jesus stretched out his hand and touched the leper, and he said, I will be clean. And the Bible declares, immediately, the leprosy left him. Oh, Jesus is, is committed to cleansing people. <laughs> Y'all don't hear me. I, I'm trying to help you with your own godly determination, and, and you want to be determined to, to follow him uh, 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 with full commitment and full resolution in your heart? Just listen to his commitment. He said, I'm, I'm committed to cleansing you. I'm committed to continuing cleansing you. But, but, but listen to his I will of confession. I love this, Matthew 10, 32. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Oh my goodness. You know what that's saying? See, it doesn't make you worthy because you acknowledge him before men. But he, even in all of your word, unworthiness, Jesus is saying, you acknowledge me and confess me before men? Can I put it like this? When we get to heaven, I look at my father and I'll say to my father, that's my brother. <laughs> Y'all don't hear me, do you? But what about the I will of comfort? Somebody need comfort right here? Jesus has made a, a commitment, commitment, John 14, 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And watch this. What about the I will of resurrection? I'm not talking about his, but this is true of ours because of his. Listen to this, John 6, 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will. Not I might. I will. You're looking for me on the last day. Don't look in the graveyard. Have I got any warriors here? He says, I will raise him up on the last day. No grave going to hold this body. Impossible. Why is it impossible, Pastor? Because Jesus has made a commitment to this body. Right? My soul will already be with him, right? But one day, there's going to be a reunion of the soul and the body, but it'll be a, a glorified body because Jesus is saying, I made a commitment and I will raise up jacks from the grave. Can I give you one more? Well, you know I was going to do it anyway, don't you? Have I got any war you say? I'm, I'm going to give you one more, okay? What about the I will of his return? Y'all don't hear me, do you? What, 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 watch this, I will of his return. John 14, 3, and if I go <laughs> and prepare a place for you. This is not just for funerals, you all. This is for right now. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Oh my goodness, he put two wheels in that one. Jesus says, on my return, it's not that I just will return, but I will come to you. And when I return, I'll take you to myself. Well, I got one last question. Aren't you happy for a Savior who without hesitation says, I will? May God grant us the grace 
to have a godly determination. We can lamp with the word of God as a lamp and a light and an intense and intentional commitment and dependence on the spirit to walk in the lamp light and to follow the lamp as God illuminates our path. You ought to give him some glory. Thank you. 